apparently a lot of time. So uh, we're going to move on. Isn't this a great day? I love this time of year because the, the weather is changing, but obviously because of what this day means. And I know, you know, there's people all over the world that this means nothing to today other than a day to get chocolate. Apparently they have delivery angels as well. Um, to get chocolate um, and to, you know, uh, to just celebrate. And there are uh, really sadly to say all over the world churches that really don't understand a lot about what this day is about, except that Jesus rose from the dead, which in, itself, in and of itself is, is pretty significant. But uh, to really understand what's going on there and, and why that's so significant is really important for us to get a hold of. And that's what we're going to try to do here this morning. So we're going to take a look at, since Tom already stole my line, he is risen. Yeah, there you go. That's right. Now... One of the things that we have to keep in mind, of all of the religions in the world, and, and there's a ton, all right? There's man-made religions. There's, there's those who depend on, you know, supernatural beings. There's all this weird stuff that's out there that's going on. The one thing that separates Christianity from all the other religions is the resurrection. When you, when you look at the, in the study of the Bible and you understand as the gospel started moving out after the resurrection and the apostles were taking it into the then-known world, um, that really the first time the gospel went up into Europe was with the Apostle Paul. And as he crossed over and went up into that area that we now know as Greece, um, he stopped at a place that all of us are familiar with. It's still there. It was called Athens. And on this mountain, um, there were a bunch of statues. And this is historical fact. Uh, Euripides, uh, Epimenides, all these kind of guys, they speak of this stuff. But they had statues all over the place on this mountain, and each statue was dedicated to a particular god. Because, you know, if you're really not sure who God is, you might as well cover all the bases. That way you don't offend him if he happens to be one. And just to make sure that this wasn't a problem, there was a, a, a literally a, 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 an altar, I guess, basically, that was built up there, and it had a plaque on it, and it was literally written to the unknown god. So again, they were trying to cover their bases to recognize and not offend any God, so they had this one. And it was interesting when you study that story, this is in Acts chapter 17, that when Paul went there, he began to reason with these guys because Athens and in this particular area was all the really, where all the really smart dudes of the day hung out, all the philosophers, all those kind of people, you know, people that can use big words when they talk and that kind of stuff. And they'd gather together and they'd, you know, philosophize, whatever you call it. Um, and as they were doing that, Paul came up there, and of course we know from history as well as the scripture, Paul was a brilliant man. He could speak a multitude of languages. He was versed in, in many cultures. He was from Syria, um, even though he was a Jew. He was from uh, Damascus, uh, but he spent a lot of time in Jerusalem, and so he had been all over that area, and he was a really smart cookie. And so when he was in Athens, he was able to speak the Greek language fluently, and so he started to reason with these guys. And it's interesting when you read the story within the context of, of what's going on there that Paul is sharing all of this amazing stuff and he's talking about this particular God. And he said, I'm going to reveal to you who this God is. And he goes through and he speaks about creation and he speaks about this God is beyond any of this stuff because heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. What is it that man's going to build that, that this God could could ever use. And the philosophers we read in that passage were, were intrigued by everything that Paul was saying. And they were captivated by this because, let's face it, it makes logical sense, especially if you're from a society that believes in there's gods of, you know, of everything. There's a god of the sun, there's a god of the moon, you know, blah, blah, blah. We call it pantheism. Um, and this belief in all this God. So all of a sudden there's this one God who is God. And in fact, he's, he's the one that, that knows us from the inside out. And they were totally willing to listen. And then he filled in as he came to the end of, of his message there. And he talked about how this God had loved this earth enough to send his son. And that that son would be the one that would set man free. And, God, and then Paul says that God proved this by, notice, raising him from the dead. And the minute he made that statement, he lost 90% of the crowd. Now, that was intentional. He wasn't worried about losing the crowd. He was worried about the 10% that had paid attention. So they turned and they walked away at this idea of the resurrection of the dead. So you see, it's not just in our day that it's 
this concept of resurrection, uh, you know, brings problems or confusion to people. This has been really throughout world history. And, but what's interesting is there were many that day that said, you know what, what, and this is paraphrased, but this is what they said, we really liked what you had to say. So we'd like to meet again and talk with you at another point. You see, that's who Paul was targeting. He knew, like we always know, that not everybody is going to receive the truth. It's there for all to receive, but people don't want to listen to the truth because if you respond to that truth, then that means there might be changes that have to take place. Because if that's the truth, there's one who's infinitely greater than we are. And of course, this is where the term Lord comes from and all of these other things. So, so the concept of the resurrection is something that has, throughout the history since it happened, um, has caused division. It's caused breakup. And as you look at the passage we're going to look at in Luke chapter 24 here in just a moment, what you, what you see is that even the apostles themselves, now remember, there was a group of 12 particular individuals. They were specifically selected by the Lord because their role was different than others. Okay? To be specifically selected is the word apostolas. We get apostle from it. So there were 12 of these guys who were uniquely or specifically chosen by Jesus himself. There were 12 to be his representatives. Their role was going to be different than everyone else's. Didn't mean they were better. Didn't mean they were smarter. It just meant they were selected for a specific purpose. Okay? But then there was a larger group which were called the disciples. Disciple simply means someone who's disciplined in following. In other words, you're following somebody because you like what they say and you like what they teach. So that's the concept of discipleship. We get our word discipline from that word, as a matter of fact. To be disciplined means to follow something and adhere to it strictly. So there was the, the apostles, and then there was the broader or larger group that were called disciples. Now, where the apostles were 12, the disciples... There was multitudes. There were thousands and thousands of these people in the day. We know from history and so on and so forth. And they would be the ones that when the apostles' ministry was concluded, it would be the disciples that would take the gospel out into the world, faithfully doing so, which would lead to everyone sitting in this room on April the 1st, 2018. Those people did their job. They did what the Lord had asked them to do. They were disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. But even, there, even though there's these apostles and there's these disciples, this idea of resurrection has always been a challenge to human beings. We don't really like the thought of resurrection, but we have no problem with putting movies out where dead people start walking again. <laughs> Go figure. Of course, it's always the government's fault, right? But that has always interested me. People will look at that, oh, you guys believe it in that resurrection, and you walk out into the parking lot, and there their truck is painted, you know, camouflage with zombie apocalypse warrior painted on the side. Where is the confusion here? It's just, it's absolutely puzzling to see. So the world will embrace this kind of stuff, but it won't embrace the true reality, that there is a life to come. And if that's true, that means there's someone who's established that life, and that means that there's someone who has said, I want you, every person that has ever drawn breath in this world, or ever will, I want you to spend eternity with me. And here's the way to do so. The resurrection. Belief in that resurrection. It is what separates us from Judaism, from, uh, from Islam, it separates us from Confucianism and Taoism and all of the isms, Hinduism. Think of any ism you want, there it is. In fact, even uh, humanism. It separates everything. So these guys, back in the day, when this all happened, they were really unsure of what was taking place. Now you got to admit, we got to give it up for these guys. I mean, they loved the Lord, but they didn't oftentimes understand him. They were puzzled by much of what he said. Sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. We're no different than they are. This is what I love. I don't care whether you're talking about the apostles or you're talking about the larger group of the, of the, of the disciples. I'm sorry. Either of those groups. What you learn is when you find and you study the lives of these people is that 
they were dorks. I mean, they really were. They were what I would call coneheads. They were, they were just coneheads. They just couldn't accept half the stuff that Jesus... And he was right there, man, teaching. They knew who he was, but they couldn't grasp the larger picture. Now, we can't blame them. I mean, here's this guy who has come on the scene who is completely different than anything we've ever seen before. We've had religious leaders. We've had rabbis that were just really not very pleasant to be around, but we've had loving, kind rabbis. We've had high priests. We don't understand those guys. They're locked away in the temple. We, you know, we've had all of these religious people. We've had other teachers. We have what God's word was for them. It was the Old Testament. We have these things. And, and all of a sudden, there's this guy who's now on the scene, and he's walking the streets. The priests don't do that. They're afraid of being touched and thereby being defiled. I mean, they would never do that. But this guy, this guy, he's healed a woman who'd, who had a hemorrhage. He's given sight to the blind and, and hearing back to the deaf, speech back to the mute. He's even raised people from the dead. Now, those were not resurrections. Jesus was the first to be resurrected. We know Lazarus, right? was, we say, resurrected, but Lazarus was not restored. The, the, the woman at Nain, her son who had died, as they're carrying his body to the graveyard, Jesus happens to pass by on the road, says, where are you guys going? Oh, we're going to go bury this woman's son. And Jesus said, no, nah, no need for that. Come on down, dude. The guy climbs down, right? And then there was the little girl, Tabitha. Remember, the dad, if, you know, he's weeping. My daughter is dead. And Jesus said, no, she's just asleep. And so he goes in and he wakes her up. Were those people resurrected? Those three? No, they were not. They were resuscitated. That's the difference. Life was given back to them. Resurrection means you're dead. You come back to life, never to die again. Now, I've said this before. Unless you know where Lazarus now lives, or, you know, Tabitha, or the young fella from Nain, um, you know, they died again. That's how we know it wasn't resurrection. It was resuscitation, maybe restoration. You can look at it that way. Jesus was the first to resurrect. So this, this idea of resurrection was really puzzling to these guys, but so was his life. I mean, he was so different than everyone else. I mean, here he was clearly recognized as rabbi, as master, as teacher, as all of these things, as healer. He was all of these things, but he was so different than everybody else. He didn't dress like all of the teachers dressed. He left his shirt untucked. <laughs> he wore jeans to church. I don't know if he wore jeans, but you get the idea. That's who he was. He was so different. And all of the people said, this guy. And when he teaches, he doesn't teach in judgment and condemnation and criticalness. He teaches with love and compassion and trying to make people understand. He was so different. And the very fact that he would put up with those guys, the 12, as well as the disciples, the bigger group, is absolutely puzzling when you, puzzling when you see what, what dorks they were, because they were just doofuses. But that's good, because that, that means there's hope for me. And that means there's hope for you, too. Okay? Because I'm not the only doofus in the room. Right? I get asked all the time, so tell me about Calvary Chapel. What is your church like? And you, some of you guys know this. And here's a great line if anybody asks you that. We're just a bunch of dorks trying to figure out how not to be dorks. <laughs> That's what we're here for. That's what we're doing. We're trying to be what it seems almost impossible to be because we want to be like Jesus. We want to be like that. We want to be that when we're in the stores, people are drawn to us. That we don't criticize and critique everything that people say. We certainly don't condemn we love. We extend kindness, whether it's deserved or not. We extend mercy, whether it's ex deserved or not. Because we want to be like Jesus. That's why we're here, right? Okay? So that's what it's about. So these guys. So now, the resurrection has taken place. It's Sunday morning. We're going to be talking about some of the details in this, but I'm going to go over them because apparently Travis says I don't have that much time. So, but we're going to be looking at some of those things. But what's happened now, the resurrection has taken place. The women have already gone to the tomb at sunrise, but he's not there. The tomb's been rolled away, and they're freaking out. Again, why are they freaking out? He had told them three times, they're going to take me. 
They're going to arrest me. They're going to accuse me. They're going to kill me or put me to death. But I will rise again the third day. He had already said that three times to all the people following him. And they still didn't get it. Again, they're just like you and I. We can hear the same stuff over and over and over again. And it just, for whatever reason, fails to resonate with us. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So the ladies show up on Sunday morning because that's the first day they could go because of the Passover, unleavened bread, and the regular weekly Sabbath. So they had to wait from Jesus being on the cross. They had to wait two days before they could go there. That's why they were there on the third day. But of course we see, we heard already the stone is rolled away. And what they see, and they're just freaked out. This is where you get that really cool statement by the angels. And you know dang good and well this was Gabriel. It had to be Gabriel. Gabriel's always talking about the Lord. That's what Gabriel does. Michael, don't mess with Michael. Michael will whoop you. Gabriel, he's always talking about Jesus. Always. Old Testament, New Testament, he's always talking about Jesus. He's the messianic messenger, as he's called. Because remember, angel means messenger. That's all it means. Simple as that. But they see this angel, and this angel says to them, why are you looking for the dead amongst the, or the living amongst the dead? Right? He's not risen. He's not here. That's where we get this statement from. He is risen as he said he would. And the women are like, Ooh, and off they go, running away, right? And of course, Jesus shows up to Mary Magdalene, to the one that really had a rough life, a life like maybe some of us in here have had, a life that most people would look at and scorn and ridicule and criticize. Jesus never did that, never. He took her as she was. He loved her expressed that love, and she became one of his most incredible followers. And she's weeping because they think somebody's stolen the body. We've read the story. And then, of course, Jesus shows up. But right now, it's not time for her to see exactly who he is and what's happened. And he says, woman, why are you weeping? And then we know the story. They've taken my Savior, and I don't know where he's at. And if they would just tell me where you've picked him, I'll, I'll take care of the body. And I love this. Love this, love this. These are all resurrection sermons that you can do or in studies that you can do. And after all of that, he's looking at her and he says, Mary. And it's not until he says her name that she goes, Rabboni, Rabbi. Right? And what does she do? You got to love this passage. She latches onto him. She's got the bear hug. She's not letting go again. She had to do that three days ago at the cross and when he had been arrested. She had to stand by and watch all of the suffering that he had gone through. She had watched as they put him in the tomb, unable to take care of his body. Her world had been completely shattered. But one word changes everything. Mary. And she recognizes. So what would you do? You would latch on to the Lord, wouldn't you? And that's exactly what she did. She latches on. Now don't listen to these wing nuts that say that Jesus was all, he's like, oh, no, Mary, don't touch me, don't touch me, I'm still a spirit, I haven't ascended to the Father. Police. He had told her, go and tell Peter and those guys, tell them boys, as we would say in Belize, the apostles, um, go tell them boys what's happened. But she wouldn't let him go. That's why he said, don't hold on to me. I haven't left yet. I haven't gone to the Father. It's okay, Mary. Go do what I've asked you to do. That's what was going on there. It wasn't some supernatural thing that Jesus was in some ethereal, uh, you know, state or whatever. And if she'd have touched him, she'd have turned to a ghost. I mean, it's, it's absurd, the stuff people come up with. It's simple. She loved him. She didn't want him to go anywhere. But he had asked her to do something. Now go do what I'm asking you. I'm not going anywhere yet. I'm not going to return to the Father. Go do what I've asked you to do. And then she goes and she tells Peter, James, John, Andrew, all of the guys except Judas. He's now met his fate by his own hand. The 11, in other words. And she tells them what has happened. Of course, they believe her, right? No. No. No, we don't believe this crazy woman. She's, look at her, man. She's all wide-eyed and, you know, because you, you can imagine what she must have looked like. Holy smokes, after, after an experience like that. So two of them, Peter and John, run down to the tomb, right? And of course, John gets there first. John is younger, probably thinner, Peter gets there, and we read that Peter didn't go in, but John did. And what they saw was the clothes, and they're puzzled. They don't know what's happening, and they go back. 
It's immediately after that that we pick up where we're headed this morning. This was Easter morning 2,000 years ago. Now, we need to understand before we get into this. Now, we've talked about this. We're going to look at some of this stuff, but I want you to get it wrapped around the axle on the details. Don't worry about it, okay? When we look at what we, as we conclude today, what we call Passion Week, you have to understand. You have to get it in Hebrew chronology. These were Jews writing about Jewish things. It was just translated into our English and passed down to the world like when Paul took the gospel. But you have to understand it within the framework of what's happening for these guys, okay? So, remember, on Thursday, not Friday, I hate to burst everybody's bubble, I even read some commentators today that I really respect, and everybody's trying to fit three days from Friday to Sunday, and you just can't do it. You just can't. And I'm really not that good at math, but you just can't do it, especially when you know he was taken down before evening. So Friday is basically gone. So how the crud do you get three days from a Friday afternoon or Friday evening to Sunday? I mean, it's ridiculous. Well, it's just symbolic. No, it's not. So we've tried to understand this. And we looked at it by understanding Moses' writings in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and all of that stuff about these seven periods of time that God established or fixed those dates. One of those is Passover, which was this day. So Jesus is crucified on Passover. Okay? So before sundown ends Passover, because remember the next day starts when the sun goes down. The Jews go from sundown to sundown. And rightly so, in all honesty. Because Genesis chapter 1 says, there was morning and there was evening the first day. That's why they do it. They don't go from midnight like we do. In fact, you ever wonder why midnight? Who came up with that idea? Couldn't you put 12 a.m. at any point? Why put it in the middle of the night? It just boggles the mind. But anyways... Uh, but that's how they do. Everything is concrete for these people. They see things from a reality. So their evening, or their next day starts at sundown, okay? So Jesus is taken down from the cross just before sundown ends Passover. He was crucified on Passover. Imagine that. Imagine that. The Lamb of God was slain for sin just like the Lamb of God was slain to free God's people from Egypt way back in the days of Moses. So he's taken down from the cross at sundown. Remember the Jews said, we got to get him off the cross. We can't do any work tomorrow because at that sundown starts the next day, which is unleavened bread. And that's a Sabbath, no matter what day it falls on. So they said, we got to get him off the cross. See, this is where religion always wants to just sort of, religion is more important than what's actually happening here. We've got to get him off the cross before, before unleavened bread begins at, at Friday when the sun goes down. So he's placed in the tomb on the 14th before the sundown. And that's their month of Nisan, their spring month. Remember, our March, April. Okay? Our solar calendar versus their lunar. They go off a lunar calendar. That sundown, Jesus is now in the tomb for a couple hours. The sun sets. That begins unleavened bread. That's the 15th of Nisan, the very next day, okay? That particular year, it would have been a Friday, okay? You can go back and look at the clocks. You can, we can do that nowadays, um, okay? Now, that day, even though it's a Friday, was considered a Sabbath. In other words, you were to do no work on it. You were to cease from working. So unleavened bread became known as what's called a high Sabbath, okay? It is a high, whoops, I'm off. What are we doing? Uh-oh, I'm back. There I am. Hello. Did you miss me? I missed you guys so much. Um, yeah. So the 15th, that's a high Sabbath. Now that's in addition to the regular Sabbath, which will be the next day, Saturday. Now this is all, there's a point to all this, which begins at sundown Friday or Saturday. Does that make sense? Okay. Don't worry about all of this. I'm just trying to explain this. Now with all this in mind, check this out. I love this passage of scripture. I just, I just love it because of what's going on. Now behold, this follows Peter and uh, John running to the tomb. 
They've come back. Everybody's confused. Nobody knows what's going on. It's early Sunday morning. It's now Sunday afternoon. And these two guys are from, that we're going to read about are from a village that's called Emmaus. Okay? And it's seven miles away. So they leave Sunday afternoon. Nobody has a clue what's going on. The women are talking crazy. They said they've seen him. Peter and John uh, went to the tomb and he wasn't there. And they're talking crazy because it looks like something really happened there that nobody stole the body. So what the heck is going on? So towards later in the afternoon that day before sunrise, you don't want to, before sunset, I'm sorry, before sunset, you don't want to travel on the roads. They had a lot of bandits in those days. You would want to get home before it got dark. That's where these two guys... Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day, that's Sunday, the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. So it's a seven mile walk, right? And they walked together and they, and they talked together, I'm sorry, of all these things which had happened. Now this is really cool because it says here, they talked together. The word literally means they argued. I don't know why they didn't translate that way. These translators drive me crazy. Translate it right. They argued. Well, you know, I think he meant this. Oh, no, I don't know what's going on. First of all, I think Peter and John are kind of wacky to begin with. You know, you can see, I got back and forth. Do you know how I know? Because that's what I'd have done if I'd have been walking on there. And that's what you would have done. Because we argue about everything. We just do. And that's what's happening here. And they argued, we're going to see this comes out when Jesus shows up. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. So it was that while they conversed and reasoned, sounds polite, for argued and, and sniped at one another, right? <laughs> Bantered back and forth, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, you've tr- you got to figure out, on Resurrection Day, Jesus, you would think, would have been pretty busy, right? I mean, it's Resurrection Day. He's got all of these people and yet there's this one story and this one thing that he, he takes a part in in this day. That makes it significant, folks. There's a thousand things that he could have been doing. But for whatever reason, during this period of time, he chose to come to these guys. And I think that's significant and why we're talking about it this morning. Because this is really interesting. So all of a sudden, these guys are back and forth. And then Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, does Jesus know they're arguing and fighting? Oh, no, he never knows when we argue and fight. (laughs) Really? He knows everything. He knew exactly what they were doing. But you know what I love about this? And he also knows the fact that they're doubting and they're confused and they're conflicted and they're all of this stuff. But notice what's happened. He draws near. It's he that comes to them. Isn't that nice to know? That even when we're in these times of mass confusion in our lives and conflict in our lives, the Lord himself draws near to us. I love that. Even when we're arguing. And we tend to argue a lot. So while this was going on, Jesus himself drew near and he went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Again, like Mary, for whatever reason, you know, Jesus is, he's, where he's, this is for you and I. It wasn't for them. It's for us to learn. I mean, they would learn from it as well. So why he does this, I don't know. I can't explain it. I don't know if, you know, he, he, what happened. But for whatever reason, there's a man that shows up and they don't recognize him. We don't know why or how. But we do know the significance of it. So their eyes were restrained and they did not know him. So this implies to us that these two individuals knew Jesus. They weren't just a couple of guys talking about somebody that they weren't familiar with. They knew who he was. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another uh, as you walk and are sad? Literally, he says, what kind of argument is this that you're having and is making you guys really sad? Now, one of these guys, then one whose name was Cleopas, answered and said to him, This is an interesting statement. Look at this. He's talking about, now granted, he doesn't know. I wonder if the Lord has ever showed up in our lives when we're doing stuff like this and we didn't know either. Probably a good thing he kept himself hidden. Otherwise, it'd be rather frightening, wouldn't it? So he says, Cleophas says to him, hey man, you cannot be the only one in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's going on. I mean, everybody knows. Dude, it's on CNN. It's on Fox. You can Google it, man. There's even people, what do you call it, tweeting or Twitter? What's it, twittering, tweeting? Whatever the crud 
you get the idea. You cannot be the only one that doesn't get this. I mean, this is, everybody's talking about this. Are you the only stranger in view? And have you not known the things which happened in these days? You know what's interesting about that statement? Obviously, they didn't know. And he said, that, uh, but he's accusing whoever this stranger is of not knowing. The funny part about this, or ironically, the stranger is the only one that actually does know what happened that day. This is amazing to me. I love this. I can just picture these dudes walking down the street, kicking the dirt, going, yeah, well, I don't know, man. I think you're crazy. I don't think that's what happened at all. I don't think those guys were right. You know, I had Jesus. I don't know, man. I really thought he was something. Apparently, he wasn't what we thought he was. I mean, you could just see it. And then Jesus shows up and said, yo, man, what's going on? What's up? What are you talking about? Are you crazy? How is it possible that you don't know what's going on? And he said to them, what things? <laughs> I love this. Okay. Things. You define for me, as a stranger, what are the things that you're talking about? Now, I read commentators that said, well, he's testing them. Here. Please. Does Jesus need to test us? He knows your heart. He don't need to test you. He already knows whether you're passing or failing. This is for their benefit, not his. He's the Lord. Come on. That's just a goofy thing to say. And he said to them, what things? And so they said to them, well, well, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet. Oh, do you see the problem here already? Now watch. Who was a prophet and mighty and word before God and all the people. What have they just done? Remember when he entered the city just a week before? Palm Sunday. And they all said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. They recognized him as the Messiah. Cleopas, at least, and whoever the other dude is, we don't know who he was. We're never told. doesn't really matter. Somebody else. They knew Jesus. They had seen. They had seen him raise those people from the dead that we talked about, Lazarus, Tabitha, and the young man. They'd watched him give sight to the blind. They'd watched him heal the leper, heal the woman with the hemorrhage. They watched him hold the religious back from stoning Mary Magdalene, who was a woman of ill repute, by saying, yeah, go ahead, throw a stone, dude. Feel free. You're right. You can judge her. But you have, to be dis you have to be free from sin yourself. Then go ahead and judge. Feel free. Of course, we know the story. They'd seen all of this. They'd seen all of this. Who do you say that I am? Jesus had said, to, at least to the apostles. No doubt there were others there as well. Who do, you, who do people say that I am? Well, you know, well, some say you're a prophet. Some say you're John the Baptist come back from the dead. Oh, they could believe in John the Baptist coming back from the dead. And some say you're a healer. Some say you're a teacher. And then Jesus says, okay, great. But who do you say that I am? Uh, uh, and then Peter, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, right. And Peter, that didn't come from you. <laughs> that came from the Lord. They'd seen all of this stuff. Well, wait a minute. Concerning Jesus' mother, he was a prophet. What happened to his messiahship? What happened to his, you know, to his word of teaching and, and all of the other things? Oh, no, they, in their minds, he's dead. He, maybe he's just a prophet. We don't know. But whatever the case was, oh, yeah, he, he was a prophet. But notice they recognized he was mighty indeed. He was mighty in what he did. He used power. He was powerful. The word literally is dunas, dunamas, which we get dynamite from. It's explosive power. That's what the word means. So mighty literally means there was power in this guy. Not just in what he did, but notice in what he said. Remember the religious of the day? Even the, the people that they sent to arrest Jesus? The people themselves, the crowds themselves, they said, we've never, ever heard anyone teach like this. Never. He was so unique, so different. But he's just a prophet. Even though he did these wonderful, mighty things before God and all the people, there's the testimony that people had seen it. This was recognized. Now verse 20. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. Wow. Yeah, he's just a prophet. All the prophets were killed, weren't they? Every single one of them. They were killed. 
Because a religious will not tolerate truth. Prophet, proclaimer of truth, not of the future. Stop thinking about the future as prophets. That's not what they do. They proclaim truth. That's their job. And that's why they were, they were killed. You know, you can go on the list. I mean, just over and over. Because the religious will never accept the truth. Because truth and religion have two different spots. Remember, Jesus is not, never was religious. He was relational. Never religious. Religion always draws its lines sets its boundaries and expects everyone to abide by them. That's how there can be better at it than others. But Jesus, absolutely not. It's about relationship, never about religious. But our chief priests and our rulers, they delivered him to be condemned to death and they crucified him. But we were hoping. <laughs> we really thought. We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. You see, there's the Messiahship. He's been demoted from, from uh, Messiah to prophet. Not that there's anything wrong with the prophets, but Messiah is the one that sent the prophets. It makes him better, right? We were hoping that it was he who was going to be the Messiah, Mashiach, we, who was going to be in the Greek, the Christ. Same word. Indeed, and here it goes. Besides all this, today's the third day since these things happened. This all happened three days ago, man. I can't believe you don't know this. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. This today is the third day, not like the third day. I put it over there in the Spanish. I think I got it right. This third day thing has driven commentators and people that teach up a wall for 2,000 years. Because everybody understands that that Passover preparation day would have been Friday because they knew that Jesus had to get off the cross on the Sabbath. So that makes it Saturday. So it had to have happened Friday. What they fail to understand is the Old Testament teaching which led to this particular day. So everybody's trying to fit three days from Friday night to Sunday morning. It just simply can't be done. It just can't be. So something is wrong with the scenario. Maybe it was symbolic. Maybe it was metaphorical. No, it was literal. It said, today is the third day. That means it happened Thursday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. There's no other way around that. And it's not like this is the first time we've seen this. Jesus said three days in Matthew chapter 12. This is when uh, he was saying this to the Pharisees. And he had told the Pharisees, he said, look, man, Destroy this temple, speaking of his body, and I will rebuild it in two and a half days? In, well, symbolically three days? No, no, no. Destroy this temple, my body, in three days I will rise, raise it again. He said three days, folks. He didn't mean three. He wasn't implying something else. He meant three days. Then the second time we see it, Jesus said three days for a second time in Matthew chapter 16. This is when he was teaching the disciples. And he said, look, this is what's going to happen. What was he teaching them? The Old Testament. Well, we don't need the New Old Testament anymore. We have the New Testament. We don't live under the age of law anymore. We live in the age of grace. So we don't need the Old Testament. Funny that God turned the world on its ear after the resurrection without a New Testament, folks. It wasn't written until after all of these things. So what were these guys teaching from? The Old Testament. But the gospel's not in the Old Testament. The heck it ain't. To which I would say, oh, bunky, stinking, hunky. Yes, it is. It's all over the Old Testament. So Jesus said three days for a second time. Oh, that's not enough. Then Jesus said three days for a third time. Three days, not two and a half. In Matthew, <coughs> excuse me, chapter 20. This he said specifically to the apostles. It was repeated again by Jesus a fourth time in the second chapter of John. And this was with the, with the religious. I mean, it just goes on and on. This was the, another time with the, the deal. 
But if that's not enough, now we read it in our account, three days. They just said it. These guys said three days. Jesus said it another time, later in the chapter, we're not going to get to this verse, but he's going to repeat three days again in this same chapter where the two guys on the road to Emmaus are found. Well, Peter said three days. You can't believe Jesus. Then believe Peter. Because Peter said three days in Acts chapter 10. And where did he use it? When he went and pre proclaimed the gospel to one Italian officer in the Roman army whose name was Cornelius, who lived in a place called Caesarea. And they were God-fearing men, him and his family, but they didn't understand. And Gabriel said, you know what? You need to get a hold of Peter and have Peter come over there. There's Gabriel again. So Cornelius is like, what? So then Cornelius sends his servants over to get Peter. Peter's now in a city very close by, a city called Joppa. And he's hanging out in one of his buddy's houses. In those days, they had the upper tops that were like an open patio on the top. And Peter's up there swinging in his hammock in the afternoon. And like me, probably ate his chocolate bunny and was sleepy now. <laughs> and he's starting to doze off. And there's a knock at the door. And while the knock is the door and conversation is going on and believe underneath, Peter has the dream. Remember the dream? I'm a Jew. I do Jewish things. But there's this sheet that's lowered out of heaven. And I won't bore you with all the details. You guys, most of you know it, right? Sheet comes down with catfish and the BLT on it. And Peter's like, oh no, I could never eat that. And God says, whatever I say is clean, it's clean. And then the guy comes up and says, Peter, they want you over Cornelius' house. So he goes to Cornelius' house. A Jew going into a Roman officer's home. Now you understand the meaning of the sheet. Stop being offended. They're going to serve a BLT. Eat the stinking thing. <laughs> I like the BLTs with extra bacon just to make sure that the flavor doesn't get lost. So that's what happens. He goes in there and he proclaims the gospel to Cornelius, his family and his friends. We're not told who they are. This guy's an officer in the Roman army. Who do you think was there? Maybe some Roman soldiers? Probably. Wouldn't it be cool if Luke was there? And we're just not told? Who knows? And he teaches them. And what he does, he gets through the whole presentation of the gospel and he talks about the resurrection. And what does he say? And God verified this by raising him on the third day. I don't understand the problem with three days. I just don't get it. It drives me up a wall. It's very simple. Hey, so if that's not enough for you, Paul said it. Now, there's quite a few references here, folks, to three days. And Paul writes, don't you know that Jesus came in, in fact, Acts chapter 15 is a great resurrection chapter, one that you can typically teach on Sunday mornings. And Paul says, look, Jesus came and he died and he was buried according to the scriptures. What scriptures? The Old Testament. But the gospel's not in the Old Testament. Really? And then he was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. The resurrections in the Old Testament? Absolutely. That's how they knew all of these things. So this three-day thing... So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this quick. I'm going to do this fast here because... Um, I'm limited on time, <laughs> apparently. Anyway, three days in the tomb. We're not going to get into all this stuff, but remember, sundown to sundown. So Wednesday sundown to Thursday sundown, if you got the calendar that we put out last week to look through the days this, of Passion Week to know what was happening during this week, that was their 14th of Nisan. For us, it was last Monday, okay, um, because the calendar switches. So the 14th of Nisan. Now, the 14th of Nisan is always Passover. Now, notice... This is Jesus on the cross till just before sundown, okay? Now, we're going to see in another one. Um, here. And then Thursday sundown to Friday sundown was the 15th. There's that, now that's that Friday, that, that high Sabbath, quote unquote. That's unleavened bread. You can see high Sabbath, Jesus is in the tomb, and they got to get him in there before sunset on Thursday. I should have put on Thursday. Sorry about that. Okay, that's day one. It's very simple. It's, it, it's not rocket science. Then Friday, sundown to Saturday, sundown, 16th of Nisan, okay? That's the regular Sabbath. Every Saturday was a Sabbath, still to this day. Been going on every Saturday, 
for since Moses gave the law back at Mount Sinai. Nothing has changed. So this is the weekly Sabbath. Jesus is still in the tomb. Day two. Okay? Then Saturday sundown to Sunday sundown is the 17th of Nisan. Okay? That's the, the very next day. Okay? That's what's called first fruits. Imagine that. The day that the first fruit that grew was offered back to God. And it was offered in March. It was the early crops, what they call the early crops. And it was the wheat. Okay? And of course, first fruits is when Jesus was rectored. So Jesus was crucified on Passover. He was buried on unleavened bread. He went, it was still in the tomb during the uh, weekly Sabbath, but then he rose the third day. It's the only way to come up with three days, unless you want to spiritualize or metaphorize all of those other passages. It, it's really not rocket science. Okay. So they're continuing on now. That was, this was the third day. And now here they're going to talk about those women we already talked about. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early, they astonished us. Again, had Jesus already told them? We just saw. He told them five times. But we were astonished because the women said he rose again. What part of I'm going to raise again do you fail to understand? Right? Yeah. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that the angels had also, had all, all, had also bleh, seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Remember? Why are you looking for a live guy in a dead world? He's not here. He's risen. Right? And certain of those who were with us, now this is Peter and John, uh, certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. In fact, we realized at that point that these ladies were not crazy. We found it just as they said, but they did not see. So this is their explanation of the stuff that they've been arguing about. Now Jesus responds in verse 25. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, now watch this, in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? You guys study the scriptures. How did you fail to see this? What scripture? Well, I can think of one, the book of Isaiah. <laughs> chapter 42 to chapter 53 clearly talks about somebody coming and sacrificing his life for the sins of his people to set them free, which of course is Messiah. You foolish ones, how do you, you're slow, how do you not believe all the stuff that was written? Isn't it amazing? We'll pick parts of God's word that we like to believe while the rest we don't because it might offend us or might offend someone else. Now watch this. He's just said, look, you need to, now watch. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, in case you're confused, the things concerning himself. Beginning at Moses, where did all of this, where did it all start? As he's telling them, where did it all start, you guys, that the Messiah was going to come and do this? It started with Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Torah. First five books, the Pentateuch. Moses spoke of these things. When? Well, on the feast days. We've already been talking about that. That's where we get Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, right? Trumpets. Yep, Day of Atonement and Tabernacles. That's where they come from, is from the books of Moses. What are the seven feasts? They're the plan of redemption. Jesus died on Passover. He was buried on unleavened bread. He was raised on first fruits. Fifty days later, Penta, 50, Pentecost, he gave his spirit to his people, which would become the church. And when he comes back again, he will come back at trumpets and he will fulfill the day of atonement, the ultimate day of atonement, and he, we will dwell with him for eternity on the day of tabernacles. It's all there in Moses. How'd they miss this? So beginning at Moses, sorry, I didn't push that one, um, and all the prophets. So it wasn't just Moses that talked about this. All the prophets did as well. And you can find Jesus and the gospel in all of the prophets. You can what I love about the prophets, though, is they add in not just his first coming to redeem, uh, to redeem, but they talk about his second coming to rule when he comes back and establishes his kingdom. He expounded to them in all the scriptures. Whoops, crud. 
Got to go back. Well, you get the idea, okay? All the scriptures concerning himself. So what did Jesus do? As they're walking along the road, Jesus just gave them a discipleship class. He gave a discipleship class to disciples because they hadn't figured it out yet. Remember what Travis said? Well, I've been a Christian for a long time. I don't need a discipleship class. Really? <laughs> okay. These guys did. So he gives them a class. Now, as all this was going on, they draw near to the village where they were going. That's Emmaus. And he indicated that he would go on further. So they think, and he's going to go on. But they constrained him. And they said, listen, man, hang out with us. Okay? Abide with us. For it's almost evening, and the day is far spent. So the sun is going down. And he went in to stay with them. Isn't it interesting? You would think that this is the Lord. These guys have failed to believe in who he is, failed to follow what he said. You would think, what the heck does he want to do hanging out with them? But he always wants to hang out with us. He just does. He wants us to, to, to love him enough to want to hang out. I don't know how else to say it. That makes more sense to me than anything. Oh, shoot. I forgot. I've got to go through my lines. Okay, here we go. Now, the fixed times. I'm going to rush through this again. Passover. This is, this is cool. It can happen on any day of the week. 14th of Nisan. It can happen on a Saturday. It can happen on a Sunday. It can happen on a Monday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It doesn't matter. Passover can happen any day of the week. Always the 14th of Nisan. Based on the lunar calendar. Okay? Unleavened bread is always the very next day. Okay? Which is the 15th of Nisan. It also, obviously, can be any day of the week. Now, but the Sabbath was every week on Saturdays. So the Sabbaths only occur on Saturday to this day. As I said, it has not changed since Moses was at the mountain and God said, you shall keep my Sabbath. The Jews have never failed for one second to not observe the Sabbath. So that's every Saturday. Those other days can be any day, but every Saturday is a Sabbath. Now watch. But first fruits, as God established it, this this what they called feast, literally the word means fixed time, first fruits, this always follows the first weekly Sabbath after Passover. Always. Okay? So that year, then, it happened on the 17th of Nisan. That was the year. This year, I can't, I can't remember. I should have looked it up. Now, here's what's cool about this. Have you ever wondered about this? First fruit always falls on the first day of the week. Always, without fail. When God said to Moses back then, these are my fixed times, my feasts, and you're to watch them throughout your generations. And he lined them out. He's telling them that every, uh, uh, once per year on a Sunday, you were to celebrate first fruits. And what are you supposed to do on first fruits? You gather the fruits of the crop that God has blessed you with and you hold them up to God. How cool is that? Imagine that. Paul says Jesus has become our first fruits. He was the first. Of course, that's always a Sunday. Now, real fast. Now, it came to pass as he sat at the table with them. This is cool. As he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed it and broke it and gave that to them. Now, what's wrong with that statement? He's in someone else's home. Shouldn't they be the ones taking the bread and giving the blessing? Yes, that was the custom. You went to somebody's house, they provided the bread, they said the blessing. But notice, came to, as he sat at the table with them, that he took the bread. He blessed and he broke it and gave it to them. Ooh, that sounds like something else, doesn't it? You think? Yeah, communion, the breaking of the bread. And what did that signify? This is representative of me and my laying my life down for you. It speaks of substitution. Now watch. He took bread, blessed it, and he broke it and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew who he was. And he vanished from their sight. This is post-resurrection. Now he didn't like walk through the wall. Okay? The, the, the eternal, as I've said before, is right here, folks. It ain't like off on some law-law cloud up there where we always say Barry Manilow's being played right? In the clouds. Eternity is right here. The Lord is right here. We always have this idea that, that it's off some far place. It's not. The Lord is always present with us. Always. That's why he said, I'll never leave you and I'm never going to forsake you. That's hard to do from a cloud, you know, millions of light years away. He's with us. 
He's right here in this room this morning. And if he chooses to do so, he just crosses the line into our reality and can step back out. That's what's happening. He didn't just walk up and show, you know, walk through some wall. Then their eyes were opened to him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one, or one another, dude, that's what I would have said. Can you believe that? Did not our heart burn within us while he talked? So as he was speaking the truth, their hearts were moved. Now heart here isn't literally the heart. It's talking about the inner man. We were so moved as he was speaking, <clears throat> just like the crowds had been before. He talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. So they rose up at that very hour <clears throat> and returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 and those who were gathered those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord is risen indeed. Now somewhere after Peter and John's deal at the, at the tomb, somewhere during that day, apparently Jesus appears to Peter. We don't know, we're never told, but this statement is what tells us that. That at some point, because remember they didn't see him at the tomb. So somewhere later in that day, early afternoon, maybe whatever, somehow Jesus communicated. Paul will tell us this again in, in Corinthians that somehow there was this thing that Peter did get to see him. And Peter had now added to, the, to what the ladies were saying. Yeah, he's, he's back and they weren't believing him. So the Lord is reason and has appeared just like Simon said he did. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. See, that was what was significant to them. That when he broke that bread, they were immediately seen. Now watch this. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself self, stood in the midst and said to them, peace to you. But they were terrified. It's amazing. We always pray that the Lord does some amazing work in our lives and then when he does it, we freak out. <laughs> right? Never fails. Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened. They supposed that literally that they had seen a ghost. They're thinking he's a ghost. Okay? And we know what happened. He says to them, no, no, it's me. Go ahead and touch me. And what I love about this story is he's after he says, touch my hands, touch my side, you'll know it's me. So they, he could physically be touched and yet could be from one realm to the other. And just to verify that, does anybody know what he does next? He said, hey, I'm starving, man. What do you got to munch on? <laughs> Isn't that cool? I love that about Jesus. There's going to be munchies in heaven. <laughs> munchies in heaven. I'm a happy, happy man. Now, we're not told in this particular incident, but we know that this same thing, that later Jesus would, would be raised and would go 40 days later. Now, when he had spoken, this is 40 days after this account, because that was all on Sunday, 40 days later. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Again, Gabriel's one of them who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? What are you doing looking at the clouds, man? You ever look at the clouds and say, oh, look at that cloud. That would be cool to see him come standing on that cloud when he comes back, right? Yeah. Why are you standing gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you in heaven, and here's the, the, the conclusion, will so come in like manner as you saw him go. In other words, what you just saw him go, that's exactly how he's going to come back. Right? Because folks, today is not just the day where he is risen. It's the guarantee that he's coming again. Amen? <laughs> Thanks. So when we go through the day and we eat our bunnies and we eat our eggs and we eat that incredible fish that Enrique is about to fix, oh, 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 I'm a happy camper. Um, remember what this day is all about. He is risen. He is risen indeed. But for as important as that is and as awesome as that is, he's coming again. Amen? Let's stand and we'll close in a word of prayer. Okay, a couple things before we conclude. We're going to...